Welcome to the State of the Nation. I'm your host, Mike Sham. Today, a wonderful guest, a man who holds a master's degree from the university, formerly known as Rhodes University. He's uh, an author, most notably of, uh, of the book, uh, The Fall of the ANC, What Next? And he's a leading political commentator and certainly one of those that I will definitely uh, read every time. And that's the one and only Mr. Prince Michele. Prince, thank you. Very welcome much. to the State of the Nation. So lovely to have you here for the first time ever. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me. Yeah, it's, it's uh, really an honor to, to talk to you. So Prince, let's kick it straight off. We're doing this interview just in the aftermath of the human rights holiday, right? Which is the 21st of March. Where uh, that's to commemorate people that got gunned down in Sharpville. Did those people die in vain? No, they didn't die in vain. Um, look, when they died, South Africa was a dictatorship. Uh, there was apartheid. There were no, there was no respect for human rights. You know, the majority of South Africans couldn't vote. Um, they were treated like third-class citizens. Uh, there was no democracy, uh, there was no freedom. Um, and today there is freedom. That doesn't mean that there are no problems. That doesn't mean that there are no people who suffer um, human rights abuses. There, there are people who suffer human rights abuses. We hear from time to time of children who die in pit latrines and so on. But overall, South Africa is actually a better place compared to South Africa before 1994. That big picture, even as we lament the state of uh, chaos that we have today, we must never lose sight of that big picture. Uh, let me just give you a practical example. In the South Africa of the 60s, all the way to uh, the... 90s before 1994 i wouldn't be sitting here with you today sharing my opinions freely as i do so they didn't die in vain and it's very important that we remember that we have to remember that because if we don't we will be tempted to call for the return of apartheid <laughs> And um, if apartheid were to return, we would have to pick up our cameras and, <laughs> and run. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a completely different country and a better one for it, but not without its problems. Well, there are many problems, and I'm sure in this interview we're going to talk about uh, those problems. Yeah. Um, but as I said, we must never lose sight of the bigger picture, which is South Africa today is better than South Africa Yesterday, And if you wanted me to give you a whole list of things that were not there um, under apartheid and the things that we are enjoying today, I can. There are many. Yes. It feels to me that uh, in the spirit of people forgetting how far we've come, we seem to also dwell on, on what's not working as opposed to what is working. And there are things that are oh, there, there is great human capital in South Africa. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's because of human nature. You know, uh, as human beings, we always aspire to have a better life. There is no human being who aspires to have a bad life. So the things that are working in our lives, we tend to um, under-emphasize them and over-emphasize the things that are not working. Why? Because we want a better life. So it's it's because of human nature. Um, there are things that are working. Let me give you an example. There are massive problems of infrastructure in South Africa. We know that, and we're going to talk about that. But people who have traveled the world would know that our highway grid in South Africa, well, the N4, the N1, the N2, these highways are some of the best in the world, and they continue to work. And do you know who manages them? It's still the state, Sandral. Um, but people will behave as if there is nothing that is managed by the state that works. There are certain things that are managed by the state that work. Uh, we just don't talk about them because the other things that don't work tend to overwhelm the things that work. And sometimes the things that don't work 
uh, will eventually degrade the things that do work. So you mentioned the, the wonderful road infrastructure, but you don't have to be uh, some engineer to understand that those roads are going to be degraded way quicker than they need to be because of the collapse of our rail system. There's no question about it. I mean, I see it every day. Like Every South African can see it. So I was born and raised in Pumalanga. I live in Gauteng now. My mother is still alive. She lives in, Puma, in Pumalanga. So I go there often, once a month, give or take. I have seen an increase in the number of trucks on the N4, uh, trucks that were never there at some point. And because I understand where these trucks come from, I can make sense of, I can make connections between the collapse of Transnet, the collapse of our rail network, and the increase of trucks on the road. And obviously those trucks are damaging the road. So you are quite right. The things that that the things that don't work eventually will overwhelm the things that that work. We can see it also with ESCOM. ESCOM is collapsing everything that works in South Africa because without power, um, there is hardly anything you can do mm. in terms of the economy, even in terms of social life, communication. You know, nowadays we can't even talk on our cell phones without you know, the lines breaking every now and then because of um, electricity. Water, uh, for example, uh, water pumps are struggling because of um, the shortage of electricity. So, yes, you are correct. The things that uh, the things that don't work will eventually overwhelm and collapse things that work, and, uh, which is why we have to talk about the things that don't work. So, let's... Uh, le le we do understand the things that don't work and we're going to get into it in more detail. But what really confuses most people, myself, head of the queue, is most of these things are quite predictable and have been predictable for a while. Why is it that the ANC government seem to never understand the effect of, <laughs> of the collapse? Interesting question. Because this takes me to... <clears throat> A theory by a, a Harvard scholar by the name of uh, Roberto Mangabera Unga. Uh, you can read the book, False Necessity, where he says that human nature is such that change is always occasioned by crises. We as human beings, we, we don't rely on our imagination to avoid crises. We actually rely on crises to entertain change. The ANC, same story. Um, they know the problems. They can see where we are going, but they don't change. They are waiting for a crisis. If you look at how the ANC is, has been conducting itself, that's exactly how they've been conducting themselves. But it's not only the ANC, by the way. It's also the general South African public. Here is the thing. For a long time now, South Africans who can analyze, who are sound, could see that the ANC has now become the massive, a massive liability for South Africa. I mean, let's be honest. The greatest liability for South Africa today is the ANC. But have people been changing? No. The majority of South Africans have been voting this liability over and over again, returning it into power. Human beings rely on a crisis before they entertain change. They don't use their imagination. That's a weakness of human nature. But we have to keep on pointing out this defect of human nature in order for human beings to wake up and say, hey, don't wait for a crisis. You have to entertain change before a crisis hits you. So um, if I were to give a, a bold advice, I would say, kick the ANC out of power as soon as possible. If you don't, South Africa is going to be in Zimbabwe. Hmm. What are the chances of this, though, Prince? Because as you say, uh, you know, the South African voters um, have been relatively loyal. Uh, and we understand there's a historic bond, perhaps, between the ANC and, and, and a, a large uh, number of our voters. But why is it that the ANC, why is it that so many people will vote 
against their own interests by returning the ANC to power? It's a very complex question, by the way. Um, Okay, let me let me give you the example of the majority of call them in the US they would use the language the underclass. Um, um, in South Africa you could call them the unemployed. So you are unemployed, you are black, uneducated, you were oppressed under apartheid, you lived in a village or in a township where you didn't have water, running water, you didn't have uh, electricity. These two things that yeah. revolutionize life, right? After 1994, what happens? The ANC brings a power line to your village, which the apartheid government didn't do. It brings a, a water pipe into your village. Suddenly, there's water in your village. It gives you the third thing, which is an RDP house for free, which the apartheid didn't give you. Right? It also, on top of that, gives you a bit of cash into your pocket, which is a grant. These four things. And then... You have some opposition party that you see on television that says, don't vote for the ANC. You would be irrational to listen to the opposition party because the opposition party they hasn't given you these four things. So the ANC has given the majority of poor black people things that are tangible. And we generally don't factor uh, those things into our analysis. So that's the thing. Those are the things that make the people to stay loyal to the ANC because they can... they. They, they wake up on the day of voting in an RDP house before they go and vote, given by the ANC. Yes, you could argue that of late, there's no electricity anymore, there's load shedding. Yes, but for the longest time, they actually enjoyed electricity. So that's the, that's the first thing. The second thing is that that group of voters are not involved on a daily basis in the kind of discourse that is taking place in urban settings where we are obsessed with corruption, billions of money stolen, and so forth. I mean, that kind of a voter who is somewhere in the, in, in the village does, actually doesn't know what is a billion rand. Uh, they know what is 350 rand vis-a-vis uh, -a, -vis a billion rand. So in the city, we are worried about billions, right? In the village, they're not worried about billions. They're looking at what they've gotten. That's what explains why people have stayed loyal to the ANC. In addition to the fact that the ANC is a liberation movement, it has liberated the majority of black South Africans who never had political rights. That's the explanation. But now, that majority has now reached a point where it is beginning to see a different reality, a shift. Because, one, they are beginning to run out of water, so the taps uh, have run dry. Two, they are beginning to run out of electricity, so they don't have electricity in their shacks, right? Four, they have been waiting for jobs for 30 years. These jobs have not been coming. Five, as they drive around go to, to town, they can see the infrastructure in their town. Their towns um, 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 basically collapsing in the form of potholes and public infrastructure. Now they can make connections that actually this ANC that used to give us the four goods is actually now a party that is destroying our livelihoods. That's why there is a shift in terms of voting patterns. And the first sign of shift is in the urban areas, which is why the ANC has lost almost all the metros in the in the uh, previous local government election, except one or two. Why? Because people are beginning to see the shift and say, no, 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 no. Um, we are no longer benefiting from this arrangement. But you have outlined why that bond is so strong. And it's going to probably not be shifted in the general election of 2024 in those rural areas. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> it, 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 it may not shift in the rural areas. And we can see the trends that the Eastern Cape, Lipompo, and those rural provinces, um, and Pumalanga, uh, you can see that the ANC is doing relatively well. Even though it has de declined, by the way, if you look at the trajectory from 1994 to where we are. Mm. But here is the thing about South Africa. And this is what makes South Africa different from the rest of Africa. South Africa, its population is concentrated in urban and peri-urban areas. So about 70% of our population 
is in urban and peri-urban areas. That's not a picture in the rest of Africa. In the rest of Africa, the majority of people live in the rural areas. So South Africans, the majority of them don't live in the rural areas. And that's where the ANC is going to be punished. And you can see the trends, which is why I said earlier that the ANC is losing metros. Why? Because metros are actually um, city arrangements. So people are moving from the rural areas to the cities hoping for a better life. They hope to get a job in order to improve their, their lives. So there the ANC is being punished. We can see the numbers. And I, I can tell you that in 2024, that's next year, the ANC will not get 50% of the vote. That's massive. So the ANC can return into government through a, a coalition arrangement, possibly with the EFF, and we can talk in detail about that. But it will not clinch a majority. Why? Because people who are in the urban areas, who constitute the majority of our population, their lives are tough and they are shifting in terms of their voter behavior. Last point. If you look at the 2021 local government elections, the ANC declined from above 50, it was about 56%, uh, to 46%. That's a massive decline. It had never happened. Mm. Why? Because it declined sharply in the main in two provinces. In KwaZulu-Natal, from 56% to 41%. In, in here in Gauteng, from about, uh, from about 43% in the previous 2016 elections to 36%. So if you hit the ANC in two provinces, that is KZN and Gauteng, everything else staying the same elsewhere, the ANC comes down to below 50%. And that is going to happen in 2024. The ANC will decline sharply in KZN. It will de decline sharply in Gauteng, two provinces which almost constitute half of our population, and the ANC will not get 50%. Once again, this is a little bit like the collapse of infrastructure. You and I can see this coming. Why does the ANC not see this coming? Yeah, because the ANC, it's no longer one party, by the way. And you see, when we say the ANC, we think we're thinking little else. Yeah. The ANC is a house of, it's a divided house of many factions, of people who are pulling in different directions. So the EFF says national shutdown, right? Figil Mbalula stands on a podium at, in Litula House and say, no, no shutdown, this and that. But there are elements in the ANC who support the EFF. Why? Because the EFF is against Sil Ramaphosa. Remember, the EFF said uh, they want Sil Ramaphosa to, to resign. They didn't say they want the ANC to fall. Look, it, um, um, uh, the load shedding that we have is thanks to the ANC, right? But the EFF says Ramaphosa must go, not the ANC. Right? Why? Because they are working with elements in the ANC who want Ramaphosa to go. Right? So the ANC is divided. They cannot act in unison. They are not one unit. There are many organizations in one, in one house. That's the problem. That's why they can't, they can't avoid um, uh, the, cri the crisis that they can foresee is coming. There are people who want actually the ANC to lose an election, even though they are actually in the ANC, which is actually funny. Do you think one of those people is our current uh, deputy president? I have no doubt about it. Paul Mashatile is a close friend of Julius Malim. And you can see the political moves. And by the way, some of us have uh, know of the meetings they are, they are having. So the deal is, Paul Mashatile must take the ANC into the, into the election next year. They know the ANC is most likely, whether Cyril is there or not, the ANC is going to get um, less than 50%. Then Paul becomes president, Julius Malim becomes deputy president. So that's, that's the deal. And then that brings back Panyaza in Gauteng because the ANC in Gauteng is going to lose. I mean, Panyaza mm. knows that. Yes. Even in KZN, by the way, the fellows in KZN are part of this deal. They went to the EFF offices. They had a meeting. The provincial leadership of KZN, of the ANC, went into the national offices of the, of the EFF in Bramfontein. By the way, that was broadcast. We saw it, right? So there is this deal that Cyril must go Paul must become president. Julius Madlima must become deputy president. That's what they are they are cooking. And Silver Ramaphosa, I think, is aware of, of this, obviously. He's client number one of our national intelligence yeah. agencies. So, yes, Paul Mashatile is working to remove Silver Ramaphosa in order for him to partner with Julius Malim and govern South Africa. I'm 
pretty sure that Sora Ramaphosa is shocked, right? <laughs> no, he's, he's not shocked. He knows. Remember, he receives intelligence. Yeah, sure. So, so Sora Ramaphosa, as we speak, he knows where I am. <laughs> right. He should know because yeah. he's the president. Yeah. So he knows these meetings. I mean, some of these meetings, by the way, are not secret. I cited a meeting of the provincial leadership of the ANC in the national offices of the EFF. We saw it, but the public actually didn't make sense of what was going on. I mean, can, can you imagine? The Provincial Executive Committee of the ANC, right, goes to a meeting with the national leadership of the EFF in their offices, right? Where was Sir Ramaphosa? Do you think that meeting was sanctioned by Sir Ramaphosa? Absolutely not. So these deals are being stuck, uh, even, even, by the way, uh, in the public domain. Let's uh, just quickly uh, discuss our president, current president, Ramaphosa. Uh, is he now completely yesterday's man? He, uh, he wanted to resign. We know that he wanted to resign ahead of the conference last year. And he's, he's behaved like somebody who is there, who, is, who remains president under sufferance. Right? He doesn't look like he wants to be there. Those speeches could not be more tired and less enthusiastic. Right? Look, in the first place, as a rule, an ANC president who is president of the state is the weakest in his second term, as a rule. Sure. But that's anyway. Yeah. yeah. So Mbeki was weak in his second term, was removed. Zuma was weak in his second term, was removed. Uh, Sir Ramaphosa is weaker in his second term and he will be removed or he will resign. All right. So that's a rule. So we have established that Sarah Maposa is weak now, as we speak. But this fellow was weaker even before his second term. Why? And I said these people thought I hated him, I disliked him. Look, there's nothing personal. I've never met a guy who has not met me. So there's nothing personal. I don't even know his children. He doesn't know my children. So there's nothing personal. This chap, people who invested in him actually made a huge mistake. They didn't understand him. One, this is a grossly incompetent man politically who does not understand statecraft. And people thought he moves into the union buildings, he's going to sort out the criminals, he'll sort out state-owned enterprises, and he's going to rebuild the state and business, this and that. No, none of that has happened. Why? Because the fellow does not understand statecraft. One, let me give you practical examples. He moves into the union buildings. You know what he does? He keeps a commissioner of the police called Ketla Sitole, who was appointed by Jacob Zuma and Ace Mahashule. He keeps him for almost three years in office. You have to be a political idiot to keep a head of a police who was appointed by your opponents for three years in office. Number two, you look at what he did in intelligence. He does absolutely nothing. He appoints Ayanda Lolo. There's an acting director general of intelligence who was there before Sir Ramaphosa came. So in the key positions around security, the man leaves that area untouched. You just have to be an incompetent uh, leader to do that. No competent leader in the world does that, by the way. That's the first area you clean. Secondly, Look at what happened with state-owned enterprises. Because there are, in the main, there are two state-owned enterprises that are very critical to the economy. Any president who is competent would have moved very swiftly to address those two. ESCOM and Transnet. Transnet transports whatever we mine to the harbor in order for us to, to export, right? ESCOM powers everything we do in the economy. Has he addressed those two? Absolutely nothing. ESCOM is as broken as it was the day Sir Ramaphosa became our president. Transnet is actually worse than the day Sir Ramaphosa became our state president. So if you take security and you take the economy, the man has done absolutely nothing, let alone education, by the way, which is another critical. What did he do in education? He returned, he returned uh, Njimutseha. Look, here's the thing. You and I, let's be honest. Would you take your children to a school where Enji Mutsaka is a principal. No, I wouldn't. Even as a school principal, she would be incompetent, right? Sir Ramaphosa maintains that person as the Minister of Education. 
Blade Zimande. I would never take my kids to a university run by Blade Zimande. So just look at that picture and tell me where is the competence. So people who invested in Cyril actually were fooled by his um, polished English accent. The man is grossly incompetent. So as we speak, he's on his way out. There is nothing he can fix. The political enemies in the ANC are working day and night to get rid of, of him. And I can tell you, he will not last. And of course, he just won't move against these so-called allies who are deeply incompetent. Gwede Mantashe, um, Pravin Gordon, Becky Tele. These people are his so-called allies. Look, I mean, just the names you have mentioned, right? If you run a business, right? Yeah. Would you appoint those people as head of div heads of divisions in your business? No. If you you were to do that, your business would collapse in a week. No wonder the state has collapsed. I mean, let's be honest about it. If we were to remove the private sector in South Africa, South Africa would be a failed state. Why? Because we've got those incompetence. Um, uh, Praveen Gordon. Praveen Gordon is incompetent. Gwede Mantashe, incompetent. Becky Taylor, incompetent. Sir Ramaphosa has not removed those people. What does that tell you? It tells you that you have an incompetent state president. Full stop. Okay, so we, we are, and for even for somebody like myself, certainly not an insider, to know full well that, uh, that Paul Mashatile is going to get him out of there and he's going to appoint Julius as his deputy president come post general election in 2024. Uh, it's as obvious as, as the big nose on my face, so we can see that. Um, what does South Africa? under the Mashatile Malema leadership look like? Chaos. Um, look, <clears throat> number one, once you get the smell of Julius Malema in the union buildings and you are a businessman sitting somewhere, you have money to invest, would you take the, your money to South Africa? You would be mad. Julius Malema is known. Uh, he stands for what? Nationalizing banks without compensation, uh, expropriating land without uh, compensation, uh, nationalizing everything, assets, right? So imagine a man like that in the union buildings. Chaos. So people would disinvest. If I had money in South Africa myself, you know, I'm poor, and Julius Malima was my deputy president, I would take my money as quickly as possible out of South Africa. The thing about that kind of combination, which is Paul and Julius, is that corruption would thrive under the leadership of these two men. And no one, um, if you're on the side of Paul or if you're on the side of Julius, would be investigated or arrested. They would make sure that they protect each other. So it would actually be a very scary government. Uh, the government of Paul Mashatile and Julius Malim. When I imagine it, by the way, my stomach tense. But almost with the most, uh, with almost any anal analysis, even with the ANC getting hurt at the polls terribly, even with the EFF not growing, that combination will get more than 50%. It may not, by the way. Um, and, and this is the interesting part. The, if the ANC gets below 40%, and by the way, the ANC has conducted a poll, and that poll says the ANC will get 37%. I'm not surprised because of electricity. And there's nothing the ANC will do to sort out electricity before 2024. Yeah, but for, what they may do is they may run the hell out of those uh, for the two weeks prior to the election. It's not going to happen. They've tried, by the way, when Jula said it was striking, right? National shut down. You saw what happened. For two days, there was no load shedding, yeah. right? Two days. And then third day, load shedding. You cannot, you cannot um, stretch um, those power stations for a week. They will collapse. So it's not going to happen. Yeah. So the EFF and the ANC may not clinch um, uh, 50%. If the ANC gets below, uh, below 40%, and the EFF gets around 10%. Say the ANC gets 37%, plus 10% of the EFF. That takes us to 47%. They would yeah. need a 3% uh, 
to plug that that gap. But they'll get that from the proxy parties, the ATM, Bantu Alamisa, uh, Patricia De Lille, they'll get that other 3%. They may, Patricia De Lille will be history after these elections. She's not going to feature. Her party is going to disappear. Just be careful because Brett Heron will write a strongly worded letter. No, well, he can write <laughs> it and address it to whoever. Um, they will disappear. The UDM, they have two seats in parliament. They can't help the ANC. Uh -huh. they, they will also disappear. Right? The ATM, ATM will still be around. There's no question about it. But it will not be enough to help the ANC and the EFF. So if there are people somewhere in South Africa who want to avoid an EFF ANC scenario, there's a formula I can give them for free. Here is a formula. Support three parties in South Africa. Support the DA massively. Support the IFP massively. Support Action SA massively. These three parties can actually hold back the EFF and the ANC. The IFP can hold back the ANC and the EFF in KZN. And already the IFP is growing there. So if you support it massively and the ANC loses terribly in, 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 in KZN, it, it slips to, to the lower 30s, then you can hold back the ANC and the EFF. The DA has a solid constituency already. That constituency needs to be retained and it can get a bit more. Action SA can injure both the EFF and the ANC in Gauteng. Look at what they did in Johannesburg in the previous local government elections. The Action SA overtook the EFF to 16%. So if you were, the Action SA is most likely um, going to do well in Gauteng. So if you were to support these three parties, I can tell you, you can hold back the EFF and the ANC. And, and by the way, the EFF is aware of what I'm talking about. Even the ANC, they are aware and they are scared. The question is, will there be people with money who are willing to pump their resources into these three parties in the name of saving South Africa. That's the question. Now, uh, you know, we've been fortunate enough to talk to most of those parties. In fact, only the IFP that we haven't spoken to. And there's, there's kind of questions around all three, uh, to be fair. And I agree with your analysis. That would be the best outcome for the country. Uh, so let's deal with those uh, those three parties and the potential issues uh, associated there. The DA seems to have uh, a problem with the road ahead for the DA. Right, they're going to re-elect John Steenhuizen, right? Just by nature of his complexion, that will not be, that will possibly cap the growth potential of the DA. Do you agree with that? I agree. Not? I agree. Look. The DA has made a strategic mistake over the past four years or so. They have retreated into a white corner, mm. uh, sending a bad message to the black majority in South Africa that black people are not welcome in the DA. That's the posture. Whether they see it or not, whether they like it or not, that's what has happened in the minds of blacks. The message is clear. The DA is a party for white people. Black people are not wanted. That's why you saw a, an exodus of black people, of credible black people uh, out of the DA. I mean, the ones who are remaining in the DA, these are prisoners of salaries. They, they can't go anywhere. They have to feed their families. So that's the major weakness of the DA. It's the race uh, issue. And by the way, we've discussed, I've discussed that quite openly with John Stiernazen and Helen Zilla. Yeah, but it seems to be an odd blind spot. No, no, it's not a blind spot to to um, John. Yeah. It is a, a it is a blind spot to Helen. Although Helen's position is sophisticated, mm. John understands that. But of course, he wants power, so he can't say "mpopalatse." Take this position because you are black. Um, if he does that, he's going to lose power personally. He appreciates that. Helen has made a strategic calculation. At some point, remember, she was the one championing this opening up of the DA, inviting black uh, people to occupy strategic positions, including Musi Maimane. It's Helen who invited Musi Maimane to be, who made Musi Maimane to be the leader of the, of the party. At some point, she made an assessment and thought that the black leadership was introducing a chaotic element into the party. And she decided to go back, remember she was outside, to go back 
and flush out this black leadership and reclaim the party. And she thinks that she needs to protect the party from the chaotic black element. That's the, it's a strategic position. I think she's wrong um, because, she's wrong because that is going to limit the growth potential of, of the DA. There could have been better ways of managing chaos in the, in the, yeah. in the, in the party. So that's a position. So yes, that is going to affect the DA, but the DA has a solid constituency. So white people in South Africa in the main overwhelmingly vote for the for the DA, and they will continue to do so. So you can't discard that, that uh, element, number one. Number two, white people are extremely important in the future of South Africa. There, there is no future of this country without white people. So Julius Malima and them who are dreaming that at some point this country must be taken over completely by blacks and it's run by blacks, they are completely wrong. There is no party that is going to run South Africa on a sustainable basis way into the future if you exclude white people and exclude black people. The formula that can work for this country is for black people and white people to co-govern. They must be there in that boardroom, all of them, and say, what do we do with our country? That's where Helen Zille made a strategic mistake. Once you, 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 you adopt a posture that says, we can do as white people, uh, in the Western Cape, we don't need black people. Then you are making a massive strategic mistake in terms of the position of white people in the bigger South Africa. Because here's the thing, white people have nowhere to go in the world. A few of them can go to Canada, US, this and that, but this is their home. Hmm. Yeah, and, and they have a massive stake. They've invested here uh, over, over centuries. Hmm. And generations. And generations. Now, let's say uh, in, in the just sort of... Uh, Completing this analysis, because uh, I think it's important. Uh, you mentioned the three parties, so we've dealt with the DA and their issues. Um, that's a, a topic for a whole separate discussion. So uh, keep your diary handy. Uh, Action essay we've had here many times. I've had Herman Mashaba here. I've had Michael Beaumont just recently. Um, once again, there's, there's issues there, and, and uh, some of the issues stem from... Uh, uh, it's seemingly that, uh, you know, they, there's, they've taken a whole lot of retreaded politicians from the DA. And I always think to myself that Herman Mashaba thinks that everybody thinks like he thinks. But a lot of those people are really seeing a better career in, the, in Action SA. And once they get there, they're going to create the same problems, as it were, for the Action SA that what they had in the DA. Do you think they will overcome this in time? Do you think their, their message is coherent enough to, to build a vote? Action SA has three problems. Let's be clinical about them. <clears throat> they are new, but already I can see these three problems and they have to deal with them squarely. Problem number one is what I would call a clash of cultures. So in Action SA, you have three characters. You have one, a character coming from the DA. Amen Mashawa is not quite the DA man. Mm. But the rest of, most of the people surround him are from the DA. Mm. They have a DA DNA. Mm. A second element is an ANC element. You also have uh, people, leaders who come from the ANC. And these two, by the way, they don't come from the same political traditions. The third element is the ordinary South African who you know, who wishes well for our country. This person was not in politics, has been excited by Herman Mashab. These three elements are clashing and they will continue to clash. Action SA will have to manage this very carefully. You've seen with uh, Bongani Baloy, you've seen with Makosi Koza and, and so on and so forth. So that's the, that's the first problem. The second problem is a policy problem. The way I see it, Action SA doesn't have a policy-making architecture. It hasn't evolved a thing like that. So if you say, what is your policy on, on international relations? You would be lucky to find a document that has been well articulated on international relations as a policy of Action SA. But look, they are young. They have to overcome it. The third problem is a problem of capacity. 
So if you were to look at the party as, as we speak now and say, Action SA, we give you South Africa to govern in 2024. Who is going to be your president? President is clear, Herman Mashaba could be a president. Who's going to be your minister of finance? Who's going to be your minister of this? You will worry. You won't see these individuals because here's the thing, a country is run by individuals. You need to constitute a cabinet. So there is a problem of capacity. So these are the three problems that are facing Action SA. But these problems, by the way, are typical problems facing any new political party. Uh, policy coherence, leadership capacity, as well as political culture. They, will they overcome come these problems? I don't know. They are new. Other parties fail to overcome these problems and they have collapsed. COPE and Ahang are two cases in point. Will Action SA follow in the footsteps of these two uh, parties? I have no idea. There are other parties, by the way, that have faced similar problems and managed to deal with them. The DA, by the way, has also faced these problems uh, uh, in its formative um, days, but it over it overcame the, the problem. So there is a possibility that Action SA could overcome these problems, but I'm not sure if they will. And then lastly, let's talk about the IFP in closing. Obviously, uh, the party was built around one person and one person only, the original Julius Malema of the country, right? Uh, Mangasutu Butelezi, who seemingly his game plan was to live forever. <laughs> and uh, obviously, he, he, around his force of character, did build a, a, a big following, but mm. killed it by not moving on. Right. Yeah, correct. It's yeah. now kind of starting to go out of the shadow and the grave of, of Butelezi. But it always sometimes seems to make fairly irrational decisions. And, you know, it doesn't overly, to, to my analysis, doesn't seem to really care too much who it gets into bed with. Yeah, look. Again, let's be clinical about the IFP. The IFP faces in the main, well, three problems as well. Number one is that of leadership capacity. So you are right. This whole party has been based on the personality of Mangusutu Butelis. Now as an old man, um, there's a new uh, leader, Labisa. He doesn't have the kind of uh, um, uh, gravitas mm -hmm. and aura that um, uh, Mangusutu had. Um, so that's the first problem. The second problem is that of political character. So the, EF, the IFP is mainly a regional stroke tribal party. It has, over the years, projected itself as a party of Zulus, right? based, in, based and concerned with the interests of the people of Zululand. Mm. Right? Not uh, concerned with uh, the cons concerns of people like me, the Shangans, or the Pedis, or the Vendas, or the Tosas. No, the e EFF had nothing to do with all of us. The, sorry, the IFP. It hasn't made a shift um, in terms of political character. It remains in the main a party of Zulus, which is why when I project, I say it will do well in KZN. I didn't say it will do well in Lipombo. It won't do well. It won't do well in the Northwest. It won't do well in Gauteng and so on. So that's the second problem. The third problem is policy. Again, you never know where the, the IFP stands when it comes to, to policy. But these things, in my view, won't hold back the IFP in KZN. As a brand, it is very strong in KZN. You can see the trends, even as uh, Butelez is aging. The party is growing again mm. in KZN because the Zulus in KZN feel that they have been they have been given a, a road deal by the ANC. And the dynamics of Zuma in the ANC have offended Zulus in KZN. So what do they do? They are looking for something else, given that they perceive Zuma as a victim of ANC shenanigans and they tend to, 
to the IFP. So the IFP will still do well uh, in KZN despite the three problems I've identified. And then lastly, let's just say we get our we get a wish and uh, the, the three parties being the DA, Action SA and IFP get over 50%, they get 50.1%. Do you think they would make an effective government of South Africa and who would the president be? Look, by the way, um, the three parties would make a better government compared yes. to an ANC um, EFF government. I'm very clear about it. Why? Number one, they would never sit in the same boardroom and say, let's steal money from government. One of them or two of them will say, no, we're not going to steal. So they will watch each other yeah. in that boardroom. Yes. Which is an, the yeah. ANC and the EFF can't watch each yeah. other. Yeah. They can sit in a boardroom and say, let's steal. But these three parties can't steal together, number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, if they can't do cater deployment together. Right. Because the three of them would say, hmm, the DA, we can see you are trying to smuggle that chap. We know he's associated with you. We no, 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 we are not going to play that game. So ultimately, in that boardroom, if you come for an interview and you are a well-qualified engineer, you are likely to get a job because these three parties will not agree to deploy their employees. So there's a chance there for ordinary, competent, qualified South Africans to get jobs. Number three, in terms of policy, none of them will get completely what they want. So they will compromise. But the basics they can cover, the three of them, by the way, would agree that you need to fix ESCOM because you need electricity. And if they are not involved in thieving, if they appoint the right people, they can fix South Africa. So in that kind of framework, I think it would be a better government. Who would be the president? If you have the DA, you have Action SA, and you have the IFP, the best decision for such a government would be Herman Mashab. Um, because if you were to say uh, John Steinhazen, I mean, we know yeah. uh, the, the racial dynamics of our country. He wouldn't be ac um, accepted by the majority of South Africans as their legitimate president. So I think the best would be to make Herman Mashaba, even if Herman Mashaba's party, by the way, is not the largest component of that arrangement. But then all of them would have, would share uh, uh, cabinet portfolios. And, and, and my sense is that such would be a better government to take South Africa through this transition of coalition politics. Look, we can't avoid it. South Africa has entered the era of coalition politics. The question is, which better combination can you have? You're not going to have the best combination, better combination. So I think the three could be a better combination in my view. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there you have it from one of the best, Prince Michele. Prince, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and thoughts with us today. This has been brilliant. And uh, to everybody that joined us today, thank you so much. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as we did. Please subscribe to our State of the Nation channel. Uh, it doesn't cost you anything and you get to see great content like this. So Prince Michele, once again, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much for inviting And uh, we're looking forward to your uh, next trip back. Thank you so much to everybody My that joined pleasure. us today. Thank you. All right.